So hello everyone and welcome to our last session of um, NCFS Unbound. Um, it is delightful to see all of you and thank you for coming today and thank you for coming this whole year. It's been a really wonderful experience and we've been just discussing about plans for the future and um, we hope to continue next year. Um, so today uh, we are very uh, pleased to welcome um, Eliza Jane Smith, who is going to discuss her um, recently published book with, uh, called Literary Slumming, Slang and Class in 19th Century France. And she is going to be in dialogue with Carolyn Betensky. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, our speakers today, our participants. Um, Eliza Jane Smith is an assistant professor of French and Francophone studies at the University of San Diego. Um, she's published on representation of French argot in literary journals such as Média 19 and 19th Century French Studies. Um, the book she's discussing today, Literary Slumming, Slang and Class in 19th Century France, was published uh, by Lexington Books in 2021. And she's going to, of course, tell us more about it. Um, her interlocutor is um, my dear friend, Carolyn Betensky. She's professor of English at the University of Rhode Island. Among other things, <clears throat> she's uh, the author of Feeling for the Poor, Bourgeois Compassion, Social Action, and the Victorian Novel, published by University of Virginia Press in 2010. She is also the translator with Jonathan Losberg of Eugène Sue's The Mystery of Paris, published by Penguin in 2015. She's co-editor with Susan Heiner and myself of a special issue of Romantic Review in honor of Priscilla Ferguson, published in 2021. Right now, Carolyn is working on two completely unrelated projects. The first, a book about Victorian print media and the compartmentalization of experience. And the second, a translation of Jules Vallès's Le Bachelier. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eliza. Um, who is going to give an um, introduction to her to her book. Um, and then Carolyn will jump in. Um, over to you. Um. Oh, all right. So first of all, I just want to say um, a big thank you to Susan, Rachel, Masha, and Carolyn for organizing and agreeing to, to moderate this event. Um, so I want to start off with this quote from Dictionnaire de la Langue Verte um, by Alfred Delvaux, because I find that it sort of encapsulates the ideological trajectory of uh, the various chapters of this book. And I won't read this quote because it's quite long, but basically he explains the process of, um, you know, criminal argot or slang when it comes from sort of these, you know, criminal uh, milieus, uh, prisons, labor camps, and it finds its way into these more democratized spaces such as cafes or cabarets. Um, and the, in those spaces, it, it becomes repeated without any kind of filtering uh, happening until one day um, the sort of curious listener, this lexicographer or writer type notices this argo and notices the creative potential behind it. And from there, it gets codified into written format and enters the mainstream into general circulation. And so this was kind of the trajectory I, I found across the 19th century. Um, with this sustained interest in criminal slang that gets democratized over time and uh, changes um, ideological connotation. So my main questions for this project um, were first, what is the sociolinguistic evolution of French slang across literary and reference works in 19th century France? Um, Next question would be, how do practices of literary slumming, which I'll explain in my next slide, evolve over time? And finally, what was most interesting to me was what are the creative and social implications of the cultural and linguistic appropriation of criminal and working class slang by bourgeois male writers? So when we're talking about literary slumming, we have to address actual practices of slumming that were popular in 19th century England and France. And so in some ways it's quite analogous. We have this you know, sort of voyeuristic foray into forbidden social realms that, you know, of course, due to class privilege, um, these writers and readers can have access to. And so there's an element of identity play, um, especially, um, not just with language across you know, certain characters, aristocratic characters who speak criminal slang, things like that, but there's also sort of an inscribed 
bourgeois violence that occurs, you know, under the guise of criminal descriptions of criminal violence, um, which is an aspect I find really interesting. So like actual practices of slumming, we have this transcendence of uh, class, sexual, social, social boundaries, um, gender boundaries, um, sometimes that, uh, yeah, also occurs in literary form. So for me, I felt that this argot, this interest in argot and criminal uh, French slang wasn't just sort of a peripheral accessory. I really found it to be the basis of the slumming um, and the, the construction of this underworld and these characters. And over the course of time, it, it gets modified, but all of these connotations continue to exist within this ideological web. Um, so for me, it's kind of twofold to you know, really simplify the idea. We have the degradation of literary content with these portrayals of uh, criminal violence, sexual intrigue, et cetera. But at the same time, we have to recognize the degradation of literary standards, the inclusion of dialects and arco, and um, even the uh, degradation of the, the printing methods and the formats of, of books at this time. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of my table of contents to give you an idea. So I have a short prologue, prologue on um, pre-modern works and the slang that appears. And it's definitely not <laughs> comprehensive, but I mostly picked the ones that were sort of referenced later on in the 19th century. And also to acknowledge that this isn't like a new phenomenon that's occurring in 19th century France. Um, for me, what's most intriguing about the 19th century is this you know, ability to produce en masse uh, these works and this collective sustained interest in it over the course of the 19th century. So initially I'm really looking at this idea of slang as the basis of the, the criminal type and this sort of 18th century typology that is occurring in this attempt to sort of contain and control. Um, I'm also looking at the body, the body language, this idea of language as an embodied phenomenon. Um, because there's so much emphasis on the criminal body and the performance of the criminal bo body, the stylization, um, the sort of playing with uh, gender codes, even though it's really not a commentary on gender identity. Um, and you know, later on in the naturalist novel, we have other elements of sexuality and things that sort of get mixed in with that. Um, I do have a chapter on the language politics of, of these works and who was actually consuming these works, who were the consumers and the debates about what is literature. Um, and honestly, you know, with the embodied aspect, it sort of inspired me to ask the question, even like, what is language? You know, if we considered the body within this like criminal slang. Uh, chapter four looks at Victor Hugo and the, the major shift that occurs with Les Miserables and the sort of melange between working class slang and criminal slang and the beginning of the democratization um, of language and of the space, okay? And of the kinds of slumming that occurs. It's not so much the depths. I mean, there is that element to it, but we see it shifting with Hugo. Um, in chapter five, I look at dictionaries where we really see uh, a total uh, shift from, you know, maybe it's becoming more democratized to sort of this kind of flaneur-esque uh, foray into the entire city. We have the shifting connotation of slang with modernity in Paris, and it's the way that hip Parisians speak now. And then finally, I end with looking at women slang speakers in the naturalist novel and specifically prostitutes. And again, there is this embodied aspect. Um, there's a component of sexuality um, and the kind of working class masculine speak these highly hyper feminized women um, have. So I just want to show you guys some images too, because I, um, I really, uh, I think these are really interesting. I mean, uh, this is before Lombroso, but we kind of have elements um, of his uh, theories in the air. With, especially with the mysteries of Paris and just looking at these visuals. Um, I can talk more about those in the Q&A. So for me, this whole process is really important because you know we have what is originally an oral language, this sort of secret coded language of organized uh, criminal societies that becomes codified in written form and becomes this widely popular form of um, of entertainment, right? And it, it predates, you know, the advent of cinema, which kind of replaces it in a way. So in that aspect, I find it important. We have the shift from class exoticization to more of a social investigation, especially with Victor Hugo. Um, 
and you know, with these dictionaries and things, also with Hugo, who partly inspired this, there's just a democratic evolution where it becomes more of a kind of flannery associated with Parisian modernity and linguistic trends and what is a cool way of speaking and what isn't. So across the 19th century, there is this nuancing. What originally started off as this desire to control and contain, it, it grew into something that they really couldn't. And we see this nuancing of social boundaries and categories. Um, and it really, in my mind, represents a radical paradigm shift in French attitudes toward literature and art and language. Um, so although this is incredibly pejorative, these representations, um, it represents a form of discrimination. I do think what actually happens is um, for a variety of factors, we see a cycle of reappropriation happening uh, in the second half of the 19th century where, you know, the members of these classes or of these uh, who, you know, own these sociolects or dialects actually begin to, to write themselves. Thank you, Eliza. And over to you, Carolyn. Thank you, Eliza. I want to say, first of all, um, how much I enjoyed this book and how fresh I found this book. This book was, um, I mean, there, there's a lot, there's a ton in it and, and um, a lot of really fresh thinking uh, about a lot of things. I can't remember the last time I read a book, which is among other things, a monograph on, you know, linguistics, <laughs> right? Uh, at, with, with, okay, with such pleasure, A, <laughs> B, um, like, at all, maybe, <laughs> um, with, you know, with such attention. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a very interdisciplinary study, um, and, and it's, it's, it's genuinely interesting and original. Um, I want to say that first, uh, and, and so it really was a pleasure. Um, so I, I've already told Eliza, I have a lot of questions. A lot of them are granular, so I'll try not to ask those, um, you know, right away at least. Um, but um, I want to start by, by, by just asking Eliza if she could expand a little bit on um, the, the idea of embodied language, slang as embodied language. I mean, this was one of the more, uh, I mean, as I said, it was a very, um, a very careful linguistic uh, study, including, you know, the, not only the chapter on the dictionary, but, but the entire study. It, it, it is very much on, on words, but she's also, in, she is interested in images. You, Eliza, as a third person, you, uh, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I, that's one of the more surprising moves you make. And I'd love to hear you talk about it more, if you would embodied slang as embodied language. Yeah, I think when I was really getting into this project, it became something that I, I felt like I couldn't ignore because again, it sort of sustained this emphasis on, um, you know, the criminal body or working class body and then, you know, the female working class body. Um, and it's, you know, them describing like, you know, for example, in Les Miserables when Hugo says like, Jean Valjean, he blew out the candle in, in the manner that a convict does. And it's just little details like that, where it's like, they won't let it go. And then, um, you know, the, the, the trope of the, the cross-dressing male criminal that keeps coming up. And then, you know, with Balzac, this sort of uh, introduction, the aspect of, you know, male-male sexual relations that kind of gets tied up into this ideological web. And it's, and it's, um, that in addition to these hysterical performances and singing like these, you know, moments where they'll just burst into slang songs. And I, I, I think, you know, given my background in, in sociolinguistics, um, there's a whole field of an embodied linguistics that language is an embodied phenomenon. And I, I don't know if I executed it, but I, I felt like I couldn't ignore it and it had to be discussed because it's not simply the way that they speak. And as you mentioned with the dictionary writers in the second half of the 19th century, we see this shift when they're sort of advocating on behalf of people, you can't just learn this language and memorize it. You have to be able to perform it and stylize it um, in a certain way. And so it's, again, it's all sort of, sustained throughout <laughs> it changes but it's always there in a way and I thought okay this is there's something happening with uh with this form of of slang that is manifested through the body you know right 
Yeah. I, I love the way that you, um, you, you were really talking about bodies and faces and, and I mean, just the, the physicality wasn't just, uh, you know, about the, the clothing. I mean, you did talk about that too, but, but I, I love the fact that, you know, it, it's really, uh, you make a very, very solid case. I thought it was really super interesting. Um, I would love to ask you um, about, like, I, I, okay, <laughs> so as I said, I really enjoyed this book. Um, I, I really liked the way you um, don't approach the 19th century as a monolith, right? Your, your understanding of history is, is like very nuanced. And um, I, one of the things I really like about your book is the way you, you're, you're um, charting movement from early 19th century texts through, you know, Zola, and I, I think Zola is the end, the end, it, it, yeah, you stop at Zola. Um, and uh, could you talk a little bit more about some of those shifts that you chart in, in your study? Like how, how what, what, what kind of movement do you see from the beginning to the end? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, as I mentioned in the earlier, you know, Mysteries of Paris, um, Vidocq's memoirs, um, even Balzac's Splendor et Misère des Courtisans, there is this kind of almost like caricature <laughs> version of the of the criminal and very cookie cutter. I mean, there's no, I mean, maybe with Balzac, we see that shifting with the elements of sexuality and things. Um, and also the, the ability of those criminals to really gain social mobility. I guess we mm -hmm. see it duck too but um yeah the the language is pegged as a this is a criminal language and these are what criminals look like and these are their bodily features and their facial features and there's really not much room for a lot of diversity there and mm -hmm. with both we see that shifting and then really with um hugo with les miserables it just becomes this nuanced mess where it's like well you have this shift from um yeah, bourgeois exoticization to more of a social investigation. We have this kind of liberal pity that needs to be um, exercised towards these social types that are victims of society, basically. And so, like, there is this socialist element, which is probably not a surprise to anybody here. Um, but it, it it starts to kind of he starts to make a mess of things where it's you know it's working class, but then it's also uh, criminal, but at the same time, Hugo really wanted to showcase his ability as a writer. And you know, earlier with Sue and Balzac, we have this illusion or this mention of the inherent poeticness of the slang language. But then Hugo kind of has this like hold my beer moment where he's like gonna <laughs> showcase it to everybody and say this is actually like what um, can be done with this this grotesque language. I'm gonna transform it into something more sublime. And then with the, the dictionaries, it's kind of a similar trajectory. If you look at earlier 19th century criminal slang dictionaries to after, you know, 1850 with all the changes with Osmanisation and things, mm -hmm. um, we enter into this like Baudelarian flaneur-esque, uh, you know, uh, let's appreciate the inherent creativity. Yes, there's still all these implied ideologies, criminal ideologies, but at the same time, um, kind of a push for, more towards individuality and democracy and um, the stance against the, the harsh, uh, you know, um, uh, oppression of, you know, Napoleon III and things. So, yeah, and then by the time Zola and the Goncourt brothers uh, with their, which, you know, again, are like super depressing images and, you know, Rachel's written about this. A lot of people have, um, mm -hmm. but they're doing weird things with language and women where it's like mm -hmm. they talk to like working class men. And I think it unintentionally opens a lot of doors. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that was really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. I, I would love to, could, could you go on talking a little more about, I'm going to open the floor in a moment if there are other questions, but, because I could go on asking you questions forever, actually, um, but uh, the, could you, could you tell us about um, the way uh, slang shifts in its meaning, uh, meanings, um, like it, performative meanings 
um, for, for women characters, female characters um, over the course of the century? Because that's, that's a particular thing you look at, right? I was very interested in, in the difference between uh, what it means for a, a woman to use slang in the early part of your project compared to the later part. That, that, that's a shift within the historical shift. I'd love to hear you say more about. Yeah, I mean, you know more than anyone with the mysteries of Paris, how bizarre the, those women are. You know, it's either, it's so polarized, right? You have like Fleur and Rigolette, um, these sort of more like, you know, virgin, virginal, you know, slang speakers. I mean, like I say in the book, and as you know too, Fleur, we don't really see her and, you know, when we talked on Sunday, you mentioned the fact that she can understand, you know, the slang, but seeing her executed is a different thing. Um, and then you have these more like hyper masculinized uh, women criminals uh, like the owl or um, Asia in Balzac's um, Splendeur, who resembled the male criminal, you know, and it's just sort of this like pre Lombrosian <laughs> um, kind of, uh, yeah. A representation um and it's not like a commentary on gender identity but you kind of see like where that could maybe be a, a prototype later on in a way mm -hmm. and, it, and then you know with the the naturalist prostitute i found that so interesting because we have these women who are well like germany lasquette is interesting because she's actively described as ugly in the novel but at the same time there's like this there's something about her that's so sexually desirable. And then on top of that, she has, she interacts with, you know, these, these um, working class women who speak like working class men and her included. And it, it's just like such a, I'm like, what is going on with this? And, and then Nana too, where we have this sort of performance of the body um, in addition to language and sexuality and, um, there's, there's things happening with gen, I don't, you know, it's not, uh, these aren't books about gender identity, but we can kind of see glimpses of mm -hmm. what's going on with the, these gender identities um, mm -hmm. through language and through the body and all these other ideologies that are sort of wrapped up in the language. I don't know, I, I think I just- <laughs> No, no, you, you that, I mean, I, I, what I can say is that like, you make a great case for the algo that the, um, like the, the later um, working class female character gets marked with, right, um, in, in these later texts, inadvertently opens the door to kinds of agency that um, some of the people here on the Zoom call, <laughs> um, you know, have written about, and, and it is really fascinating. And, and I also love the fact, I, I don't know if, if this, I don't know if, okay. So you're, the way you show that um, somebody like Fleur de Marie or Rigolette, um, yeah, they understand slang, but, but we never see them using it, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's, it's in its absence that slang is really gendered in the earlier um, representations by bourgeois authors. Yeah, and the agency part, yeah, it's like these, these characters don't, these women characters don't really have, maybe characters like the owl, I mean, it, you know, the ones that have really chosen a life of hard, hard and crime, you know, but it, it's true that, you know, like the body we see with Nana, especially, you know, the body as the vessel that produces language, but then, you know, in these moments where she like swears at men or she talks in these vulgar ways, it kind of disrupts the fantasy and then all of a sudden it, it's like she has these pockets of subjectivity <laughs> through the way that she speaks you know and I reference um Jessica Hope Jordan's book you know where she looks at these you know American screen sirens like Mae West and it's sort of you know the precursor to to that kind of phenomenon but it's true in the mysteries of Paris um it's a really complicated text to to work with in that sense that um, like Fleur is just such a um, an impossible character sometimes because mm -hmm. uh, there, there's so many elements there um, mm -hmm. uh, her identity. So um, are there questions yet, or should I ask another question? Let's see if. Uh... 
No. Oh. Ah, okay, you got one. So Melanie Conroy asks, what are some of your favorite slang words that you had to dig to understand? A lot of literary slang seems to be a bit cleaned up, but there are certainly passages of Sue that remain opaque to me. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Um, I don't know because, okay, this is, I actually found, so what was really difficult, I was very fortunate to Carolyn in the work she's done um, with the translation of Mysteries of Paris, because th there are passages where you're like, wait, what? <laughs> what does this mean even? So that, there's another uh, translation of Les Miserables that's really recent that helped me, but then like um, A Harlot High and Low, I was just telling Carolyn before we got on, you know, the translations from like the 70s or, or the most recent ones, they just leave the slang in French. <laughs> they don't even deal with it. So I'm really, I had to reference a lot of dictionaries usually, and I had to just sort of um, consult a lot of different, I'm trying to think of favorite slang words that I had to dig to understand. Well, Hugo just invents stuff um, that, you know, again, I, I had a, a good translation I could work with. Um, but yeah, there's a really great site called Argoji <laughs> that I used a lot, um, where they have just like lists of, and you know, piecing it together. But I'd have to think more about your question, Melanie, because I'm not, I'm kind of blanking on, there's some words that are, you see over and over and over again, and you just, you kind of try, you start to pick it up yourself. But then those times where you're like, wait, what, I've never seen this. And then having to comb through all these dictionaries to try and figure out what it is. Mm. So we have a question from, I, should I be, um, moderators, uh, Masha, Rachel, should I be reading these out loud? Everybody can see them. What do you think? Read yeah, out loud? I think it's, I think it's good to, to read it out loud. Okay, cool. uh, um, hi, Eliza, says Jack Blaschkowitz, whose name I've probably just butchered and I'm sorry. Um, I work on music and the built environment and uh, the closest to musical argot that comes to mind is the C, S, C, I, E, a song genre that is less about the words used and more about incessant repetition and intrusion into bourgeois spaces. Whoops, uh, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> ah, my, it's slipped my screen, so I can't read more. One second. One second. Uh, a, a, I got it. Yeah. You got it. Can you read it? Yeah. A song genre that is less about the word used and more about incessant repetition and intrusion into bourgeois spaces called boulevards, trains, omnibuses. Ha -ha. Uh, do you have a sense of how the rupture of normative sound uh, timber, uh, not just the rupture of text, plays, in, uh, plays a role in transforming bourgeois language into slang? That's a really great question. Um, I wrote an article on criminal noise uh, a couple. So yeah, there's sort of a lot of, I'm trying to, so when you say it plays a role in transforming bourgeois language into to slang, do you mean like the reappropriation of standard language? Yeah, I'm here if I can just chat with you. Hi, um, yeah. So. I, I, I'm really interested in just, you know, how, how, how sounds can be working class without necessarily the like reference of text. Right, right. So is, is there something about the way, and, and by timbre, I guess I'm, I'm referring to um, the, the kind of the mode of the sound production, whether it's a particular instrument used or, or a particular grain of the voice. Mm -hmm. um, a, a sound, a guttural sound typically in like cafe concert, that kind of thing. So I'm just curious if you've kind of found any, evidence of how sound was being um, used as almost a, a way of discerning between like the working class and the bourgeois, not to put those into like completely separate yeah. categories, but you know. I think it's a great question. And I, um, I, there, there are probably people here that maybe can answer that better than me, but I, I found, especially with earlier text with um, Last Day of a Condemned Man, with Vidocq's memoirs, um, and probably in the dictionaries if I went back and looked at them, uh, but, yeah, this, this sort of conflation between noise and hysteria and criminal s singing. <laughs> like they're, they're always singing. It's really interesting. They're singing behind, you know, prison bars. They um, have moments in the, you know, prison courtyard where they burst into song at bars. They're bursting into 
song, but it's always associated with like either surrounding noise and it's not rhythmic in any way, or there's, there's no um, perhaps different than, I don't, I don't know much about working class representations of, of singing and song. And I'm, perhaps that's more regulated than criminal song or maybe not, you know? Um, but I definitely found a correlation between noise, either they'll start describing noise before the performance starts or they'll start singing and there'll be noise associated with it. But it's, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question at all. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a messy question because we obviously can't hear the past, right? right? So all we have is text, but through that we can kind of interpret other senses as well. So I think it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, um, if you, I, in part of the book, I kind of look at these more oral modes of, of storytelling and, and, and language such as the vigil, the night vigil and things like that. And um, you know more than, than me with your background in music, like this, this whole oral component, but there is such a strong oral component to, to slang. Um, and, you know, the conflation between criminal and working classes, the working classes as well. Um, but I'd have to look more at later representation. I mean, women like Nana and things, there is this sort of, um, vulgarity in the fact that they shout, they, you know, they're really loud, these loud women who, who speak in this vulgar way and they're actresses. Um, but yeah, um, that's a really great, that's a really great thought provoking question. We have another question in the chat uh, from Colin Foss. Um, he says, I wonder if you have any thoughts about Creole languages in the 19th century or otherwise extra European linguistic variations in the 19th century. Ah, okay, that's a really great. So I didn't look at Creole, but that would be like a really cool thing for somebody to, to look into. Um, what I did find though, is that a lot of times uh, in Balzac, uh, um, in Vidoc's memoirs, especially, there is this conflation with criminal slang and either French dialects or foreign languages, um, like Italian or um, uh, like uh, dialects of um, Roman Michel, like this kind of thing, um, these sort of like othered social types. And so I kind of talk about this linguistic scapegoating where it's like the the idea, the connotation, the social connotation is sort of all wrapped up of like, oh yeah, these people are othered as well. And so that they have these like criminal undertones to them um, too. Although like someone like the, the, the Baron Nussingen or whatever in, in Balzac, his like very parodied Jewish Polish dialect is like a, a source of, of comedy, but at the same time, you kind of still do have um, some parallels where there's a scene where Esther like imitates him and they write it out phonetically. And it, uh, there's interesting things happening with um, these, these, but I, ex that wasn't extra European, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't found anything um, extra European, but um, that would be a really interesting area of exploration. Uh, absolutely. So I actually, I have a, a question. I'm going to turn my camera on. Um, so, um, it, you know, you you kind of end in the, I mean, I, I kind of hate my own question a little bit, you know, you talk about X, but what about Y? Uh, um, so what happens in the, do you know what happens in, let's say early 20th century, right? So your, your bookend is Zola, right? Or, you know, more or less Zola. So do you, I don't know if you had a chance to look into what happens, you know, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, is there a shift? Is there a shift around World War I? Yeah. Uh, what happens with this phenomena that you were, that you were studying? Yeah. Um, like are there specifically 19th century occurrences and yeah. do things shift? Um, I think so. I mean, I think we see even in, um, you know, the late, 19th century uh, with writers like Rashid, these writers that are, you know, or even the memoirs that are coming out, um, prostitutes or the working class that are writing their memoirs, um, writers like Colette who are, uh, you know, writing these really um, unconventional char women characters who are divorced. And, you know, I'm thinking of La Vagabonde. Um, 
even Isabel Eberhardt, like these different things they're doing with language and, you know, uh, you know, women are now representing themselves because the book is just on, you know, it's just text by male writers. Um, Pascal Gaeté, she, she looks at 20th century, what's happening with slang in the 20th century, um, with Céline, with Cano, um, with, uh, you know, representations of working class slang and um, the shifts that happened in the early 20th century. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's definitely um, coming full circle near the end of the 19th, definitely into the 20th century, where we have this kind of cycle of reappropriation happening. Um, and this is also due to like, you know, literacy, literacy rates improving and, you know, the, the reforms with education and, and these aspects as well. Um, but I felt like I wanted to, you know, with uh, Gaité's book show what was happening earlier because for all of, of that to happen with Céline and Cano and, um, the, and she looks at, at La Samoir as well, um, there had to have been something before that. So I think what writers were doing earlier in the early 19th century really laid the foundation for it to evolve into um, these sort of uh, acts of self-representation. I have another question to piggyback on. Uh, you, you, you just mentioned literacy. So can I ask you, um, Eliza, to share with, um, with these folks here, um, some of your thinking that led you to uh, show how um, I, this, I, I love this feedback loop you analyze um, where, where early in the 19th century or early-ish, you know, first third of the 19th century, bourgeois writers, you know, descend into the abyss and, you know, carry their, their slang, uh, packages back up into respectable, you know, commit them to literary form. Um, and then with the, the rise of mass literacy later in the century, um, the people who, to whom slang had been attributed as like a primary um, tongue learn that they're supposed to talk that way and they adopt some of the slang that had been attributed to them by the bourgeois authors of earlier in the century. I, I would love to hear you talk a little more about that if you can. Um, yeah, like I don't, I don't know. Little insight. Right, no, it, it is kind of interesting what's going on and, and then like this sort of geographical shift to Paris and things and so um, Yeah, I, it's like, a, um, you know, with the improvements in, in, you know, reforms for the working class, the literacy, there is this democratization that just inevitably happens. And um, they still acknowledge like the criminal connotations associated, but then, yeah, it becomes this like hip way of, of speaking. And then they start to label criminal slang. They use the British word can't. They say that's can't. That's not argo. <laughs> argo is, you know, what, you know, ever the, the language of modernity, basically. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it's a joke. I don't know if they're being, you know, I'm sure there's a, an, an irony to it. Um, but the the readditions of these dictionaries, for example, that were consumed by these these middle class readers, the, sometimes they have up to like six readditions within you know a span of uh, thirty or forty years. So people were buying them and they wanted to learn the language. And, and but it's the same phenomenon that happens nowadays with uh, popular culture, although it can be you know called out more with social media and things like this. Um, yeah. We see a lot of it in, in music and in, in film and uh, things like that now. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to see if there are any other questions. Ah, you got one. Oh, somebody, Margaret says she can't wait to invest in this wonderful book. Ah, good, good move. Uh, wait a second, I, I'm for some reason having a hard time reading this. Uh, Okay, I've recently been looking at Toulouse Lautrec for my teaching, and he strikes me as somebody in the close friendships he formed with sex workers. 
um, as somebody who truly welcomed and with whom found his milieu. But might that be too late in the century for the exact process you described three decades into the Ferry reforms? Um, what would be too late? Uh, looking at Toulouse Yeah. Um, I don't think so. Oh, okay, <laughs> thanks, no worries. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I, uh, I, I don't know. Let me look at this again. Um, so what's interesting is like the Goncourt brothers, Zola, they relied a lot of times on these medical texts, right? And they were also frequenting um, these processes. What's interesting with Toulouse Lautrec is the sort of visualized um, portrayal of prostitutes, right? So like you do get that embodied aspect in his, um, in his work. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, to, in my mind, you know, his um, immersion in Montmartre, that whole area, it does seem like a form of it, you know, in this um, representation of sex workers in his art and things, um, especially as a man, <laughs> a bourgeois man. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think it does represent kind of a, for, a form of slumming. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of them are profiting off of it in some way, whether it's sexual or monetary or for like, you know, artistic glory. Um, we do have that power dynamic that's there um, where it's like, okay, these people that had no business in representing uh, you know, the working classes are saying, you know, I know the true authentic language of these classes and a lot of time they make it up or whatever. It's just, um, it, it, it is in my mind, part of that whole process that is, you know, um, kind of defining the, these acts of, of slumming, this appropriation basically, and then marketing and branding it for some personal profit. But it's interesting to think about. Any other questions? We oh, oh future research. Yeah. I'm really, really into. I'm really um, right now. I'm working on uh, looking at bourgeois violence and the way it's inscribed within spaces of criminal violence. So I'm kind of looking at geography and um, ideas of third space and yeah, these these sort of. Uh, sanctioned realms of obviously criminal violence, but then inscribed in over that, these acts of middle-class violence. Um, and then I think um, I'd like to shift away. I'd like to work on, on a project with women. So I'm kind of looking at um, clothing as acts of resistance and, and things like that. But that's kind of like a half-baked idea right now. Um, but that's a good question. So Jennifer Forrest writes, uh, Jean Richetin, Les Gueux, et cetera, Marcel Schwab's fascination with study of and incorporation of the slang of the underworld, the kind that keeps outsiders out. I, Jennifer, um, is, this, is this like for future research or can you, can you, you wanna come on and say hello? <laughs> Are these suggestions or, yeah. Well, uh, it just seems to me that it becomes continues to be very rich even at the end of the uh, yeah. the century and and it's used by uh, decadents and symbolists right yeah absolutely yeah like that's the thing it's like it's always <laughs> there's this like sustained interest in it where you know Schwab um, they're, they're still conducting the these these studies these you know philological studies these um, uh, yeah, these representations. So it's a really good point. Um, thank you. That's a really great topic. Eliza, um, um, what, what in, in, in all of the considerable work you did to pull this together and all the thinking you had to do and the, the sorting through, um, like the, the masses of documentation and everything. What surprised you the most in your work as you, as you came to bring it from its initial stages into the book it became? 
if yeah. that makes any sense. It does, yeah. I think um, uh, this might not be that provocative, but I think it was just how explosive and like throughout the 19th century and how prevalent it is. I mean, it was so hard to write. This was my doctoral work, but like even doing the prospectus, it was like, there's just so much text to work with. And when I started thinking maybe this is a potential avenue of research, I did not expect for there to be so much. Like it was really hard to weed out, you know, and to eliminate because it's just, it's everywhere, you know, it's everywhere and it's, it's sustained throughout. So I think for me, that was the most shocking that this was like really um, uh, a decades long phenomenon uh, that fascinated writer, writers and artists. I mean, um, uh, you know, the different caricatures with the the slang inscriptions on the bottom, and it it it, it pervades all mm -hmm. forms of art and popular um, media. So, yeah, I think that the, the fact that it was just because I really when I started, I was like, there's going to be nothing here to work with. This is sort of probably a dead end idea, and it was quite the opposite. Any other questions? So maybe we can um, invite everyone to um, turn on your cameras and um, ask your questions live at this point. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for, I know it's the end of the term. Um, it's such an exhausting point in the semester. So I really appreciate people and they're, you know, showing and um, asking their wonderful questions. I want to add, I want to say thank you to Masha, Masha, Rachel, and um, Susan for uh, inviting this former French, 19th century French person back into your fold <laughs> for the moment, for the day. It's, it's really nice to reconnect with you all. Yeah, Carolyn, you will always be one of us. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Eliza, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation and Carolyn for your expert interviewing and, uh, uh, and wonderful questions and um, everyone for participating. And um, if, um, please, please turn your cameras back on so we can see everyone before we all disperse for the summer. So hello and welcome to the latest 19th century French studies unbound our occasional series uh, about books in 19th century studies and I'm Susan McCready and uh, I've, I've um, helped to co organize this with Rachel Mesh and with Masha Belenke and we're thrilled to have you today. Um, today's speaker is Anne Linton and she'll be speaking about her um, her new book. Unmaking Sex, the Gender Outlaws of 19th Century France, which is hot off the presses from Cambridge University Press. Apparently um, the US release date is not until June 2nd. So only a lucky few have the book in their hands already. Um, luckily for us, Rachel Mesh is one of those people and she'll be interviewing Anne in, in just a moment. Um, so Anne holds her PhD, Anne Linton holds her PhD from Yale University. She's Associate Professor of French at San Francisco State University. And before joining FSSU, she taught at Boston College. Her research interests and publications focus on inter interdisciplinary topics in 19th century cultural studies, including gender studies, literature, photography, and the history of medicine. She is co-editor with Raisa Rexer of Yale French Studies first volume on photography, which is YFS 139, Photography and the Body in 19th Century France, which came out last year in 2021. Um, so I've already said uh, her book is Unmaking Sex, The Gender Outlaws of 19th Century France, 
with Cambridge. And I will put a discount code in the chat so that you can uh, order your copy. And she'll be interviewed by Rachel Mesh, who is professor of French and English at Yeshiva University in New York. And Rachel is the author of three books on gender in late 19th century France, the most recent of which is Before Trans, Three Gender Stories from 19th Century France, which was published by Stanford in 2020. Building on this work, her article, Trans Rachid, A Roadmap for Recovering the Gender Creative Past and Rehumanizing the 19th Century, just appeared in Dizneuf's special edition on new directions in French studies. So with that, I will turn it over to Anne Linton. All right. Well, first, I just want to thank the organizers of NCFS Unbound, Rachel, Susan, and Masha, for inviting me to present uh, my book in this series, you know, which throughout the pandemic has been a way to stay connected with colleagues um, and has really increased access to uh, new ideas and new books in the field. And so I'm just thrilled <laughs> to be a part of it. Um, I also want to thank the brilliant scholars and really kind humans um, um, whom I met through NCFS, the conference, um, over, over many years, um, who, you know, took the time to read my book um, in the midst of a global pandemic, no less, and blurb it. Um, so, you know, Nick White and Andrea Goulet and Andrew Counter and Peter Brooks, if you're out there, thank you from uh, the bottom of my soul. Um, I have a presentation, so I'll just um, share my screen. So what is Unmaking Sex about? Um, it's a cultural prehistory of intersex across medical, legal, and literary discourses. And it explores you know, both ideas about non-binary sex and the lives of people born with bodily sex variations in the past. So what's intersex? Um, this is one definition of intersex from the really important intersex rights advocacy group, Interact. Um, today, we think of intersex as an umbrella term, um, you know, for a broad range of bodily sex variations. Some of these variations are present at birth. Some of them appear later on. Some of them aren't physically apparent on the body. Um, but because these sex variations are naturally occurring, people have been born with intersex traits in every time period. Um, the word intersex though, didn't exist until the 20th century um, and both the term and its meaning are still being contested. So my book um, relates contemporary intersex scholarship and activism to the historical category of hermaphrodism in the 19th century, which is a word that's no longer used in a human context and has been perceived as derogatory to many intersex uh, people today. Um, you know, though others have reclaimed it uh, for themselves. And so because of this, I use the word analytic, I use the word intersex analytically rather than as a category of identity to describe individuals with bodily sex variations. And so my goal in doing this is to be very attentive to cultural and historical specificity while at the same time not reifying derogatory uh, terms, which is really important. Um, so why 19th century France? Well, it will come as no surprise to our audience today that 19th century France is crucially important, um, not just to understanding the prehistory of intersex, but also the entire um, history of sexuality. This is a time when medical publications skyrocketed, um, legal, capture, legal uh, headlines were, um, I'm sorry, legal cases were capturing headlines um, and even novelists were scrambling to write on gender ambiguous embodiment. Um, so my book reveals the profound interest, influence that non-binary sex had on writers and its central place in debates about science and social order and morality and sexuality that are still with us. Even today, November 8 marks the Intersex Day of Remembrance because it's the birthday of Hercule Barbin. Um, the, the, the author, the French author of the only known memoir of a 19th century intersex person. Um, the first chapter of my book traces how Barbin's autobiographical writing has influenced the history of sexuality from the time of Barbin's death in 1868. And really from that moment forward, Barbin's writings became a touchstone for 19th century cases that warned about how difficult it was to make um, sex determinations. Um, and 
it's really for only for the second time. It's really uh, Barbon's memoirs really become famous for the second time uh, in the 20th century um, when Foucault uh, republished them in 1978. Um, and it's in the English edition uh, from 1980 that he uh, publishes uh, his influential theory of true sex. Um, but it isn't just Hercudine Barbin. Some uh, contemporary ex uh, experts estimate intersex variations to be as common as having red hair. Um, and so there were many, many uh, individuals. Um, and I try hard in the book to piece together the stories of others like Baba who might not have left their own writing, but still have important things to teach us about challenging the binary model um, during the period of its emergence. So in the book, um, you will find um, hopefully a more comprehensive prehistory of intersex than uh, we've had before. It's based on an archive of 200 fictional accounts, um, and it offers new readings of canonical fiction by some authors that you've definitely heard of, and also some lesser known uh, popular authors that are marginalized authors that you probably haven't heard of, or you might not have heard of, I'll say. Um, the book is structured in two parts. Um, the first is a cultural history of gender ambiguous embodiment, and it combines um, analysis of Bauban's memoirs with that of medical and legal narratives to show that there was really a lot of resistance to this idea of true sex in the 19th century. And the second half rereads canonical and popular fiction within this new historical context um, to show how writers experimented with the boundaries of sex and self in the novels. Um, and then finally, in the epilogue, I relate the 19th century resistance to true sex to the completely different, but in other ways, um, sort of related emergence of transgender. And I also relate it to the modern intersex movement, um, which, is, which is really, uh, really important. Um, there have been a lot of, there have been important points of friction between uh, both groups. Um, and so I want to be careful not to inflate, inter, uh, conflate intersex and uh, transgender. But um, intersex and transgender people are united in the belief that they should be the ones making uh, their own decisions about what kind of medical care they receive. Um, you know, that they would have access to or could also choose to refuse and that that right to choose themselves is like a fundamental um, is a fundamental human right. Um, so intersex, you know, is not trans <laughs> intersex is not transgender, um, as I've said. Um, and I know many people in the audience today, uh, many of us have thought about um, sex and gender in the past. And it's complicated because the terminology uh, that we, the distinctions that we have today and the language that we have today um, didn't exist in, in 19th century France. A lot of them didn't. Um, you know, so intersex isn't transgender. Some people are transgender. Uh, some intersex people are transgender. Most of them are not. Um, but there's a lot more overlap in, in the 19th century between what we would think of today as gender crossing practices um, and sex variations, because the sex gender distinction is a modern construct that hadn't been invented or problematized at that time. And so this is why the book engages with critical frameworks beyond intersex studies, including work on historical trans studies like Rachel's. Um, you know, and also queer and, and feminist theory. So someone like Vijulia Anna, who's pictured uh, in the dress and hat on the screen, um, and who's one of the historical figures that I examine in the book, she was assigned female at birth, but she ended up meeting with a series of doctors who diagnosed her sex differently um, in each instance as an adult. And so gender identity is another anachronistic concept in the 19th century, but Louise Julia Anna lived as a woman um, and was to many passing as a woman. She had a woman's job. She was paid women's wages for them. She wore women's clothes. She also slept with uh, men. Um, but some doctor, but, but to some doctors, she was actually transing gender because she had uh, one, at least one testicle. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety in the 19th century about, uh, you know, in these cases about what was seen as homosexuality and any, any non-reproductive form of sexuality. And so I look at the different historical factors um, that made this anxiety particularly acute at different moments throughout the century. 
Um, and there are also a number of novels um, in which authors imagine the gender crossing practices of intersex characters. Um, so this is a picture also of Clémentine on the left um, from the 1820 novel, um, Clémentine, Orpheline et Androgyne. Um, so, you know, all this to say that the sex, gender, sexuality distinctions that we've made uh, today, and, you know, the sex, gender distinction that's now also problematized as well, um, none, none of those distinctions existed. And so we see all of those aspects come into the historical case studies um, of hermaphrodism when, the, when doctors are struggling to make uh, sex determinations. Um, so um, why might this be interesting? Um, recent work in historical trans and intersex studies shows us that the way that sex was understood in the past isn't you know, totally obsolete. So once we understand that the historical reality of true sex was much more nuanced than previously thought, we can understand that the gender binary was neither natural nor immutable or really even something that's always been with us. Um, so by showing the contested and complicated nature of true sex, it's a way of disrupting the erasure of the identities and the experiences that it silenced. Um, and I think that there's an urgency to understanding that, you know, 19th century categories like hermaphrodism and true sex emerged and shifted as a result of specific historic contexts, um, because it helps us to understand how contemporary categories are also um, shifting. Um, so the 19th century uh, concept of true sex is still bound up in debates about how to name all sorts of experiences that challenge the binary, you know, whether they originate from the body or one sense of self. And this system for naming gender variations is as dynamic and historically contingent as ever. Um, we're living in a moment in which non-normative identities and experiences are increasingly mainstream, but also increasingly under attack. You know, just last week, the Biden administration announced a non-binary uh, option X for US passports. Um, Le Petit Robert just recently added YEL. Um, but we also have major transphobic uh, legisla legislation being passed in many states. And, um, you know, that's restricting the access to gender affirming care that we know is life-saving. Um, and, and intersex, uh, children um, and babies are still being subjected to what are called gender normalizing surgeries um, in the country in this country uh, to this to this day. So I think it's important to know that even in the 19th century, which is a time when we think uh, when we've been taught to believe that the concept of true sex really solidified, that there was a lot of resistance to this idea um, and across multiple different discourses. So the 19th century isn't just a homogeneous block of time in which like true sex always won out over non-binary sex. Um, it was more complex than that. And there were also these historical individuals with sex variant anatomies like Louise Julia Anna, who I talked about, who made their own sex determinations and who negotiated bi binary constructs uh, creatively. So the, so the larger story that I hope that my book is telling is how these historical debates about sexual uh, difference and gender boundaries continue to influence and can still be meaningful for how we think about sex and gender in the present. So that's it. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, thank hi. you so much, Anne, for that um, overview, which was so um, clear and gives a great taste to our audience of all the things to discover in this book. I feel slightly guilty that I own this copy and Anne has yet to have her hands on it. Show everyone the copy. I'd love to see it. Yes. It's see? real. It exists. It's so nice. And it's really nice paper. If you're in the UK, you can get it very readily. Um, but we're building up suspense for the June release here in the States. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, um, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions and then um, people are welcome to put things in the chat, which I may or may be, may or may not be able to multitask and, and follow. Um, otherwise at the end, we'll, we'll open things up more, more broadly, but feel free to just keep dropping things in, in the chat as they come up. Um, there's a lot to talk about, but first I just wanna ask you about how you came to this topic. Um, I believe this was based on your dissertation. Um, so if you could maybe talk a little bit about, about the process and maybe about how um, 
um, your thinking has has shifted and um, you know over over the years that you are putting this together. Yeah, thanks. That's um, that's a great question. This is, book was many years in the making, so my thinking has changed a lot, um, and um, the terminology uh, has, has shifted vastly and is still really rapidly changing. I know that's something that we've talked about, um, Rachel. So we we can talk about the whole uh, fraught issue of of terminology, maybe uh, maybe more in depth. Um, but um, you know. The book started when I was preparing many years ago, when I was preparing my orals, um, and I kept seeing characters described as um, hermaphrodites or androgynes, like hermaphrodite or androgynes. I thought, what is that? What does that even mean? And why is what was this fascination with gender ambiguous embodiment in 19th century France? Because it wasn't um, it wasn't a word I was seeing coming up in. Um, literature from other periods, certainly not for, not to the same degree. Um, and um, so, you know, I wondered, you know, why, why then? What was it? Um, and a lot of the scholarly interpretations from literary critics really focused on the influence of mythology. Um, and some of it's really, really compelling. Kari Wells' book, Androgyny and the Denial of Difference, is really, really um, excellent. Um, but this whole general explanation of the mythological origins of androgyny didn't go very far in explaining why precisely in the 19th century there was a sudden resurgence of, of, of this fascination. And so I had a feeling that you know, something else was going on. And when I read Hercule Barbin's memoirs and Foucault's um, thesis of true sex, I needed, I, you know, I realized that I needed to learn more about embodiment and I needed to know what was going on in these medical cases um, in, in the 19th century. Um, you know, Foucault's thesis of true sex is really that, that he puts forth in, in, in the memoirs is really that um, each body can have one binary sex and it might be obscured in cases of, you know, hermaphrodism, but um, it would absolutely be there and it can be, it can be uh, figured out. Um, and so I found um, Alice Drager's book, um, Hermaphrodites um, and the Medical Invention of Sex from 1998, which is a book that um, uh, is really pathbreaking, um, but it starts in 1868, the year of Bauban's uh, death. And so I wondered what was going on before um, that time, you know, the time when all of these, these novels uh, were being, a lot of these novels were being written. Um, and so I went to the library and I was fortunate, you know, at Yale to have really excellent medical historical library. Um, and then I was in France for our uh, for the exchange year at the ONS, and so I was doing re research um, at uh, the BU Santé Médecine at what was formerly the Musée du Puy-Tan, which is now shuttered. I said this took so this this book took a long time um, to uh, to write, um, but while I was compiling um, my database of all of these cases. Um, I was also finding these novels um, at uh, um, at the BNF, these very strange uh, popular novels that described the adventures of characters with sex variant bodies, um, you know, with titles like L'Hermaphrodite and L'Hermaphrodite au couvent. Um, and, um, you know, Unlike the, you know, the canonical classics, these these novels were about um, intersex. And so this was really um, another aha moment when I sort of realized that the, even the well-known canonical novels like Balzac, Serafita, and Mademoiselle de Maupin, these, these novels were part of a broader network of stories um, that were interrogating the boundaries of binary sex um, and not just uh, gender. So, uh, so that's sort of that's sort of how the how how the project uh, coalesced um, initially. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, your book just. Um... It does so many great things. Um, it, you know, I think a lot of us have encountered these texts and we're, you know, we're, we're aware of them and don't really know sort of how it fits together with um, historical circumstances, history of sexuality, right? So you're, you're really um, putting these things, frame, frame, offering a new framework and a new lens that really just kind of 
things just sort of line back into place in a really, um, very, really clear and, and helpful way. So I want to kind of walk us through that um, a little bit, just to give people a sense of how how you do that and how you bridge um, the medical and the literary and kind of provide some of these mi missing links. But I think actually I wanted to start with Elfine Baubaum because that is the thing that we all know and was such a fascinating part of your book. Um, because of, of course, of course, Foucault, <laughs> of course, Foucault isn't like totally reliable, right? Um, so he got some things wrong, um, but it was fascinating to see just kind of, we, even without Foucault, how important Arcunine Barbin is to this, this bigger narrative. So maybe we could just start here um, with how you, you know, what you've discovered about um, the actual Herculine Barbin and um, how you reframe Foucault and that sort of um, sets this whole, um, and, you know, story in motion. And also just the, all the, you know, how important was Foucault? How important was Herculine Barbin um, in tracing this whole thing from the 19th century really to our current day? That's a lot. So <laughs> yeah, that is a lot. That's a lot of questions. Let me see. I'm I'll, sorry. That's all I'll connected in my answer, head. But, um, I'll try to answer Take whatever some piece of it you like. Redirect me um, as I forget um, various parts of it. Um, you know, so, um, you know, Foucault makes a kind of a hyperbolic claim that he's um, rediscovered um, Baubon's memoirs, that they weren't very important um, at their own time. But Actually, um, Barbin's case is the single most referenced um, case in like really in the whole 19th century. Um, so Hercules Barbin, because some people might not know, um, might not know this story. Um, Barbin um, was born in 1838 um, and um, registered as a girl on, on the birth certificate, which is something that the civil code required within three days um, of birth um, as Adelaide Herculine Barbin. Um, and then in 1860, um, Barbin sought medical care because of like extreme uh, abdominal pain. Um, and there were a whole series of medical examinations that eventually led to illegal sex revision. And so Alexina became Abel um, in the eyes of the law. Um, and Barbin left to Paris um, to, to you know, seek the anonymity of the capital um, and a fresh start, but really rapidly descended into despair um, and destitution and tragically committed suicide um, in 1868. And um, really almost from that moment, you know, that's when the memoirs were found. And almost from that moment, um, Barbin became uh, hugely important in, in, in the medical record. Um, doctors cite Barbin's case as evidence of uh, you know, the very uh, dire consequences of incorrect sex assignment uh, at birth. But Foucault reads um, Barbin's memoirs as evidence of this Victorian belief in true sex because of the legal sex uh, revision. But queer and intersex scholars, scholars have really written about Bar Barbin's memoirs and shown that that's not really, <laughs> Barbin doesn't talk about uh, desire in those terms at all. And the way that Baobao writes about selfhood um, and gender is much more fluid um, and dynamic than, than the way that Foucault, um, you know, reduces uh, uh, the way that he, he frames them. Um, you know, before Foucault <laughs> published them, they were also published, you know, uh, by uh, Tardieu, the very famous medical forensics expert in 1874. Um, and he also uses them um, to, to make his own argument um, about true sex. Um, so the, the important fact um, is that this whole idea of true sex is very much built by powerful men um, around sex variant bodies, first in the 19th century and then again um, in, in the 20th century. And when you actually look at the cases, it's so much more complex and nuanced uh, than, than either Tardieu or uh, Foucault really leads us uh, to believe. And so that framing of true sex is problematic. Um, uh, and you know it's it's not what what Balban is writing about um, in in the memoirs. Um, 
So yeah, I I, I think um, one of the things that you that you do, and I know you talk about, you know, really trying to do this, and it's challenging because there aren't that many kind of direct first person voices of um, these intersex nineteenth inter- century um, people who were, you know, in the medical records. Um, but you bring back Barbound's voice um, in ways that surprisingly, even though that was their memoirs that were published, sort of been lost um, and sort of recenter the narrative and you also so you're kind of bringing back these um these these human lives um and the doctors are another kind of group of people that you bring back um in that process and I thought that was so interesting the way that you trace um the ambiguity you know these these doctors who kind of couldn't decide sex even though there was a pressure to to do so that's part of the record that you recover um, and there's a real kind of sense of them as people trying to make decisions and interacting um, in those records. And that's sort of one of the places where you find um, intersex voices from the 19th century to kind of flesh out, so to speak, um, the story that you're telling. Um, and I, so I thought that was one of the, you know, one of the really interesting contributions that you make. And that's part of the sort of the refiguring of, of Barbin and sort of taking, you know, I guess, um, pushing against these, the, the narratives that you're talking about by these male doctors um, who, who, you know, so for so many decades had the last word um, and sort of determined how we think about these things um, to this day in, in various ways. Yeah, we're so fortunate to have the memoirs. I mean, it's such, it's such an important historical document. It really reminds us that behind every case study, um, every medical document that you read, um, there were historical individuals who experienced um, love and struggles and all kinds of um, uh, full and rich lives that the medical record can really never, uh, never recover. Um, what is left um, is, um, st- you know, stories about um, historical intersex people. And that, that is, that is really problematic. Um, but I try, um, in the book, you know, to piece together these, the stories of these individuals. And I think that it's still important, um, to think about, um, because there were many, many more, uh, individuals, um, and, um, you know, it's important, um, it's important to see, what ha- what happened to them? You know, many of them were very poor and ended up in in public uh, public hospitals. But it's like uh, I think to me, it's a question of uh, visibility. So um, by you know this this long standing argument about true sex um, that Foucault advanced has really obfuscated, has really erased um, a lot of the complexity of the medical record and a lot of um, and a lot of the evidence that shows that you know his you know, intersex people have lived at in every single time period um, and and that's really important and I think that even um, in its own way. Um, this this whole myth of of androgyny that's coming out of literature in its own way that has also kind of contributed to um to a little bit of a historical blind spot um because we haven't because we've thought of androgyny in literature as somehow detached from its historical moment and somehow n- not at all related to um these historical representations of of hermaphrodism in the 19th century Um, it's allowed us to think of androgyny as really detached from the specificity of its, of its historical moment. Um, And, um, and so that can be problematic, I guess. Yeah. um, And that's one of the, that the way the two sections connect is super interesting. Um, So I want to let you kind of fill in some of that for us. Um, One of the things that comes through is the way that, you know, we tend to think of medical science as a kind of progress narrative. Um, and, um, and one of the things that, that, that you show is the way that, um, you know, the increasing positivism and role of science and thinking about gender and sexuality actually puts limits on gender, um, that didn't exist in, in, in earlier times in ways that were sort of more fluid models or fluid 
more models of a fluid gender and sexuality um, and, and earlier in the 19th century than later in the 19th century when the true sex or the le- belief in true sex seems to kind of um, at least um, be sort of more, that's where science is, is heading. Um, so um, can, you, can you talk a bit about the, some of the stories that, that make that link? Um, one of the things that you, um, that you challenge is that androgyny in 19th century French literature is about mythology. Um, and also that there's a difference between this, these sort of different types of hermaphrodites in 19th century French literature. And you kind of show how, um, how they're not as different as, as they have been sort of categorized as. So you're kind of, you're just challenging categories left and right. Um, so do you want to talk a, a bit about that, about the literary side of things um, um, okay. and how you situate that in historical context? Um, the literary side of things. Okay, so there's there's been a longstanding, you asked an interesting question before that about um, about gender, but uh, um, okay. So you can, you can take whatever of mine. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just... I have a lot, I'm reacting in real time. Okay, so, um, great, that's Take, great. take that's it awesome. however, in whatever direction you see fit. Yeah, um, well, okay. So you said that, you know, that there was a more sensitive notion of sex and gender that existed in the early 18th and 19th century. Um, and like this, um, like the, I think where you're getting this is because of the story of Clementine, um, which is fundamentally a story that is not about um, figuring out the true sex of Clementine. Um, it's more about uh, Clementine's adventures throughout the course of the novel. There is like a heteronormative ending. Um, Clementine gets married, um, but but the mystery moving the plot forward isn't at all the mystery of um, doubtful sex, which is something that you see in a lot of other novels. But I don't think I would totally characterize it that way. Like it was more fluid and um, uh, dynamic in 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 the late 18th or early 19th century. Um, I think that even the novels that we think about as um, challenging, um, even the novels that we think about as you know really novels about gender, like um, Balzac Serafita or Mademoiselle de Maupin, um, even those novels that use the mystery of of unknown sex to motivate the plot, um, even those novels um, are subverting true sex in their own way is the claim that I make um, in in the book. So even though they're taking up this, this, what you would think of as a medical question, like which, uh, what is the gender of this this character? They subvert it in important ways. So like in in Henri de Latouche's Fragoletta, I argue that Latouche is dissociating um, uh, sex from individual body parts. Um, And um, in uh, Balzac's uh, Serafita, I I make a claim that, um, you know, that novel isn't just about uh, an angel. It's a novel about um, being um, human as well. And the role, um, that sex and gender and crossing those boundaries, um, had to, had to play in figuring out what it meant, uh, to be a human. Um, and, um, so yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, absolutely. I guess what I'm pointing to, um, and not, not disagreeing at all, um, is that I'm seeing sort of that there's less of a, and this is what you're arguing, there's less of a rupture. Um, that those are all present, but then right. the plot of doubtful sex op- upon which so many of these stories turn makes us think about it in terms of this either or, even though when you read more closely as you yes. do beautifully throughout, you see it's actually much more ambiguous. And right. so I'm sort of tracing back to, as you mentioned in the book, the Chevalier, Chevalier Deon and the Abbé de Choisy, where you had, um, and Clémentine, these stories that didn't turn on, you know, their, 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 their ending didn't turn on is, is, you know, what, what that, what the, what the mystery solving that, that particular mystery. Um, and so you can see the links, um, but there's a shift towards, you know, at least as far as plot, that kind of no ability, even though the story themselves, the stories themselves, you know, contain that, that are uh, subverted, as you say. So 
Um, and I think that that, um, you know, it's your, you, it, it, it's, it, it's posed in binary terms, even though there's this evidence of the non-binary as well. So that's a, that part of that complexity um, of these stories. Robert Steele asked a question on the chat that I just wanted to give you an opportunity to clarify okay. um, about Foucault. Um, yes, yeah, so are you suggesting that Foucault believes in true believes in true sex? My reading is that he is attempting to document the historical existence of the discourse of true sex, but that he's contesting the notion. Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great question. Thank you, uh, thank you for um, for uh, bringing that up. When um, you know, <laughs> Foucault, my argument uses a lot of Foucault. Um, and it's very Foucaultian when I'm also contesting some ideas about the arguments that uh, you know that Foucault makes. Um, you know, Foucault says in the preface of uh, Hercule Barbin's memoirs that um, we've always uh, that you know that starting in uh, actually he says starting in the 18th century. Um, this biological, um, this need to uh, determine sex, um, to identify sex binarily um, is really um, present and that it's entrenched in, in the 19th century. Um, in the memoirs, you know, he, he, he's been really, he's been, he's been really critiqued by, you know, Judith Butler famous, famously for imagining a time before um, true sex, um, when uh, there was much more uh, freedom. And, um, you know, Butler shows that um, Foucault is, is, uh, is contradicting, contradicting his own argument in the history of sexuality in, in the in the preface um, to, to Barbant's memoirs when he's when he's making that claim. You know, there is no existence outside of the heterosexual matrix. That's um, uh, that's uh, her claim uh, there. So I don't know if I've answered the question. Um, well, Robert Steele, if you have follow up, you can you can put it in the chat and everyone else also please feel free to throw your questions um, into the chat. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, so with stick, sticking with those literary texts, um, there's, do you want to talk about those different types of literary categories of androgyny and how you break down the distinction between them, between, um, what Balzac was doing and what Zola was doing, which were normally had been traditionally seen separately? Yeah, um, sure. Um, there's sort of in a lot of um, in a lot of writing about androgyny, there's a kind of a critical separation between the romantic myth of the the, the androgen and the decadent uh, um, myth of the hermaphrodite. Um, and this is a useful critical tool, but it's also in many ways a false dichotomy. So. Um, the argument is that as pessimism gradually, gradually replaced optimism, um, that this myth was pathologized. And so you don't see medicine before um, the first half of uh, the 19th century. Um, and actually a lot of critics, literary critics especially, um, who've written on this have given much more nuanced accounts um, of uh, in Balzac's writing uh, in particular. My argument in the book is that um, if you consider popular literature, um, it's really a, a false dichotomy, um, but you can already see um, both both aspects combined in um, in uh, in very well known novels. So in Fregoletta by Latouche, you know, you have both images in uh, both representations. Um, and in Clementine, <laughs> you know, you have me medicine starting in 1820. So, um, so I think we could we should get away from that dichotomy a little bit. I think it's. Um, um, I think when it came out of literary criticism, which was, you know, in, in the 1950s, it actually happened at a time when, um, you know, part of the insistence of this theory is that, that literary representations of androgyny have nothing to do with um, 
with historical representations of intersex. And when that happened, when this argument was made first in the 1950s, it was a time um, when um, uh, intersex was becoming increasingly invisible. Whereas, you know, a hermaphrodism is something I argue the category of hermaphrodism is something in the 19th century that becomes increasingly visible throughout uh, the time period because of these skyrocketing cases, because of, you know, the skyrocketing number of medical uh, venues for publication because of the memoirs, because of these novels for, um, and for all of the reasons um, that many people in this room have written about, you know, the social um, changes uh, in the 19th century that made, um, uh, that made anxiety surrounding uh, binary sex and sexuality so acute in the 19th century. Um, you know, all of those, um, you know, all of those, all of that art, that the, um, the critical viewpoint um, was written when <laughs> at the same time, John Money um, was working at the Johns Hopkins um, Gender Lab and um, the bodies of intersex people were being normalized. Um, and so intersex was becoming invisible. So I don't think it's, exactly um, a coincidence that that literary criticism at that time period wasn't aware of the possibility of sex variant bodies um, when that argument came out. And so I think that's another instance in which um, if you think about the, uh, the broader historical concept, uh, context and culture um, at, at the time these texts were written, it really helps us to understand or maybe change the way we're reading uh, these, these literary texts. Um, so in, in, um, in Zola and Gautier, we move from kind of talking about like physical visible physical characteristics that need to be uncovered or determined to um, what we might think of more as gender identity. Um, and I'm, I wonder if you could talk about that distinction and what you think those, uh, those authors are working out something, um, something different and how, I think you also show in the book, how they still are drawing from similar um, medical narratives to to, and cultural context to tell those stories. Yeah, um, for Mademoiselle de Maupin, um, um, so that is, um, you know, that is a novel that is about um, gender. You know, the the reader knows um, the identity of uh, Mademoiselle de Maupin, Théodore de Serran, but the other characters don't. And so it's a variation on this uh, unknown uh, gender plot. Um, but um, the ways that the characters are trying to figure out uh, Maupin's uh, gender, what, you know, gender um, in the novel are based on sex determination. So what they're using is um, what Foucault called the regard clinique to sort of scrutinize uh, Maupin's body and figure out um, you know, try to identify a true sex unsuccessfully, um, I will add, um, right? Um, but that's a novel in which, um, you know, Maupin famously repudiates both masculinity and femininity by saying, je suis d'un troisième sexe à part qui n'a pas encore de nom. Um, and um, I read this doesn't yet have a name, the encore, um, as, uh, as, um, reclaiming um, a historical category um, that um, had been used by uh, doctors um, and um, just before Maupin came out. So like in, in 1833, a Dr. Bouillot um, uses the, the concept of a third sex um, to try to restrict the rights of historical intersex people. Um, and um, to try to strip them all of all of their civil rights. Um, and so I, I read this, this as a reclaiming um, of, of that category. Um, so I think that, you know, you know, sex and gender, as I've said, and as we all know, the way we think about sex and gender are distinct now from uh, the way that we thought about them in the past. But it's, 
useful to think about what was going on at the time because it can help us to reread uh, that novel. You know, also Maupin describes the transing project using medical terminology. There's, uh, you know, a description where Maupin talks about using a scalpel and dis dissecting a uh, man in order to figure out what's going on. And so that's really interesting because you have, um, uh, you have the non-normative character, um, the transgressive, the gender uh, transgressive character, who's really taking up uh, the medical discourse and using it against, um, you know, patriarchal order. And so I think that's really interesting. Um, I think they use those contexts differently, really interestingly. Yeah. Um, and that was going to lead me to my next question, which David Powell um, also articulates here about shifting terminology. We you kind of reference the, the shifting language um, at the outset. So maybe this would be a good time to talk about that. I just I hear it anticipated in what you just quoted. Um, but he says, I'm wondering about shifting terminology, the historical timeline, but especially the causes for the shifts. Um, I'm not sure if you mean that uh, from today's vantage point, David, yeah, but- Which but, terminology? Um, but maybe you could just talk about the language that you use and um, at what, you know, the questions about pronouns that I know you've also um, grappled with in terms of how to talk about these figures from the past. Yeah, um, that's such a, you know, the question of terminology is so, so, so important and it's shifting so rapidly. Um, um, and I spent weeks and weeks <laughs> anguishing <laughs> over what uh, what to do um, and how to do it fairly um, and what was the best way and how not to um, really mess it up because I think it's really important. Um, but I can really only say I, I can't say I made the right decision. You know, all I can do is talk about why I made this is the decisions that I made um, when I was writing the book. I can't say I would make the same decision now or that I would, uh, you know, do that in the future um, either. Um, but it was really, really important to me um, to be careful not to reify um, derogatory terms. And so that's why I use the word intersex, even though um, you know, it's it's anachronistic at the time. I think you can use it analytically without having it be an identitarian uh, category. And so that's what I'm doing. But at the same time, it's really important to think about um, think about sex and gender in the terms that people had available at that time. You know, there's been so much writing about, you know, not foreclosing or um circumscribing um, past identities or experiences um, that, that might give us an, an option to help us rethink um, our own contemporary categories. So, um, you know, I, I use the historical terms when I'm engaging with those, um, with those texts, which I think is really important. Um, the last consideration, you know, is one that literary scholars will appreciate. Um, I don't want to imbue contemporary terms with a bunch of baggage, a bunch of extra baggage. So like in the fourth chapter on degeneration theory, I look at how degeneration influenced um, actual case histories of uh, hermaphrodism at that time. And hermaphrodism came to be associated with uh, it's a very dark chapter. It came to be associated with mental illness and um, and with a sort of deviant sexuality. And the those are two uh, associations that intersex, which has its a lot of baggage um, on its own, uh, didn't need didn't need. <laughs> um, and so um, so I think you know any any choice that you make is going to have um, is going to have consequences. A lot of intersex, you know, people who who were labeled by doctors um, intersex really reject that term because um, they, you know, either because intersex was originally a medical term and they think that um, uh, they don't want uh, you know, they don't want medical, they don't want to associate medical treatment with a, with a, with a bodily variation that, 
isn't a medical um, emergency or because they identify binarily and so they don't like the they've written about you know, intersex some intersex uh, scholars have written about not liking this um, the non-binary association with uh, intersex so you know terminology is really uh, really complicated and, and fraught. And I've thought about it very carefully and I can articulate why I've made the choices that I've made, but I would definitely would not claim that they're the right ones. Well, I think uh, it's interesting how you put that because I think that is like a kind of um, stance for us now, which is, you know, we, we feel like we have to figure it out or that we, we should figure out what the language is and then we can all agree on it and we can use it. But actually, um, as you say, we can sort of figure out how we can best use today's language to talk about the past. And as we talk about it with each other and the, the conversations evolve, you know, we're going to keep, the language will keep shifting um, necessarily. And I think that's, that's fine. I think that we have to accept scholarship in this area, um, you know, not expect it to be trying to reify some kind of way of talking about things. Cause we see what happens when things, sort of get established and don't get questioned for decades after decades. So they're, they're, you're offering tools to think with that other people will think with. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, I appreciate the humility around that, that that's just the language that you're using to make it clear to us and we will take it and work with it and you will as well. Um, so um, I'm, uh, there's a question from Ryan Pilcher and I invite everyone to ask any last questions in the chat and then we'll, we can open it up and officially thank Anne and, and turn our cameras back on um, for those who are, who are off. But Ryan asks, in the early 19th century, anthropo anthropological discourses in France used binary sex and gender as quote, signs of civilization, leading to intersections between sex, gender, sl sex slash gender and race. Yeah. Are there any instances where you see discourses of intersex embodiment invoking the language of civilization development in an, in an evolutionary sense, et cetera? Yeah, that's such a good question. Thank you for that. Um, that's a really important question. Actually, in that um, that 1833 stand by Bouillot that I just mentioned um, in the context of Mademoiselle de Maupin, that is a... Um, a uh, speech in which Bouillot marshals the racist discourse of colonial France in, in order to try to strip um, historical intersex people of their civil rights. Um, and so that's, you know, a concrete example of, of where, um, uh, where that really does come, uh, race really is um, important. Um, and there's also, you know, tangentially, not tangentially, but in, the, in a lot of the novels, um, of course, uh, we know exoticism is a really, uh, really important um, theme. And so there, there are um, racial aspects that come out in representations of you know, um, exoticism in, in, in the text. For example, um, Clémentine's, um, uh, Clémentine's mother has Clémentine because of this, the scientific belief, the pseudoscientific belief in maternal impressions um, at that time, which was a theory that said that what women were thinking about while they were pregnant would influence the bodies of, of their children. And so because Clémentine Clementine's mother really wanted a daughter, but also was fantasizing about the very sexy visiting uh, ambassador from Persia. Um, Clementine was born as you know half uh, half half man, half woman, or both uh, uh, both sexes. Um, so yeah, race is really uh, really important, um, and I'm so glad you asked that question. Great. Well, I think we are just about out of time, but I want to um, invite everyone to stay and continue to talk. Um, I want to thank you so much, Anne, and congratulate you on this book, which I hope you'll have your in your own hands before thank long. Um, and thank everyone for being here. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. And I invite you to turn your cameras on now. <laughs>